Hello, this is Kelly Henderson with Formed Families Forward. Welcome to our session, Beyond the Buzzwords, Creating Trauma-Sensitive Schools for All. I'm going to have our, my colleagues introduce themselves. Beth? Hi, I'm Beth Spivak, and I work at Formed Families Forward, and I am the Family Support and Outreach Director. Hi, my name is Jenna White. I'm with the Fairfax County Council PTA. And you're going to get to learn about uh, both our organizations uh, shortly. We thank you for joining us uh, for the session for the Fairfax County Public School Special Education Conference. A Foreign Families Forward Briefly is a family-led resource center in our region. We support foster, adoptive, and kinship families who are raising children, youth, and young adults with special needs. And we work with the professionals who support our families. Um, we offer free training, uh, consultations to families. One-on-one uh, -on -one consultations can be done by phone or in person. We have lots of events, including a great event um, on April 17th um, uh, that you are welcome to join in if you have that opportunity. Um, resources uh, and systems navigation. We also have peer support groups for youth and young adults. We have peer support groups virtually for parents and caregivers. We do lots and lots of webinars. We have a child care program um, going on right now uh, that is close to new registrants, but uh, always uh, looking for new opportunities to support our families. And we have produced a number of videos, one of which you'll see today. We are a participant in a number of the Northern Virginia trauma-informed community networks. And Beth and I are both trained interface, ACE interface uh, uh, providers. Um, we are also the family partner to Virginia Tiered Systems of Support or VTSS, which is a Virginia Department of Education project and our email addresses are there for you. We're always glad to hear from you. Jenna. And as Kelly mentioned, um, the Trauma Informed Community Networks, we do have one in Fairfax and I represent, represent the Fairfax County Council on the Trauma Informed Community Network. That's where I met um, Kelly and Beth. I do that work as a parent advocate after experiencing some trauma in our family and our struggles and our journey uh, working with the schools over the years has brought me to do this work. And then I've also started a group that you'll see here, PACT, Promise to Address Childhood Trauma, that's also um, kind of taking this work forward. And at the very end of the presentation, have some contact information for all of these various groups. So today, um, just a quick overview of our learning intentions. We're going to go over some basics about trauma including traumatic stress and what happens to our brains, a little neuroscience. We'll look at the impact of trauma on students and families and staff. We'll look at some strategies that are focused around the child that um, and the child that's been impacted by trauma. We'll look specifically at some self-regulation skills and how to improve those, uh, both for tools that families can use and staff can use. So let's get started with um, looking at trauma and diving into some of the basics. So there's um, quite a few definitions of trauma out there, but one that is very typically used is from SAMHSA, uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And you can remember it by the three E's. So the first E is the event, and that can be a single or a one-time event that has a beginning or an end. It can be multiple events or a series of ongoing events, or it can even be a set of circumstances. Um, and then the second E is looking at how those events are experienced by the individual. Something that is harmful both emotionally, um, can be physically, and really that it has an element of threat. So we often think of trauma as something really bad that happens, um, that is certainly true as well. But what makes something really traumatic is that that component of, of fear, of helplessness can be terror sometimes, that threat to someone's safety. And then the third E is looking at um, the effect. So um, hopefully if we've experienced something difficult over time, we can recover. But when something is traumatic, it really has a lasting adverse effect on us in many different realms of our well being. And when you're looking at um, kind of who gets to decide if something is traumatic, it's the experience or it's the, um, the effect that's more important than the experience. Um, so it's that last E of effect that's really important. 
And then um, going into a little bit of um, basic brain science, trying to condense this down quickly. So the most important thing to think about and understand is that um, trauma really does impact our brain. And when I just mentioned a set of ongoing circumstances, particularly what's relevant here is children who've been developing in a situation that is um, ongoing, is an ongoing traumatic situation. And that's because we know the importance of early childhood development and everything that's happening inside our brains. So here's a couple images that can help us think about um, how our brains are wired. You see the slide here with our neural connections. And from the time we're born, we don't have a lot of connections. We're very helpless. We depend on our caregivers to take care of us. But through our experiences with the world, we start forming these neural connect connections every second. They're just exploding all of the time. So you can see here the progression um, from a newborn to six months to two years. And how our brains are wired is really dependent on experience. And one of the ways that you can remember that is this graphic here it says neurons that fire together, wire together. So our brains are really um, sculpted and wired from our experiences. Um, if we uh, have experienced a lot of trauma, our brains will be wired in that way based on um, how we've experienced things. And the bottom two pictures kind of help us visualize, you know, a, a clean kind of circuit board. I mean, think about how our brains are, are wired um, compared to that just kind of messy jumble of, of wires that are tangled. And there's a saying, you know, our, our signals got crossed. And we can visualize almost when we see a, a child who's well-regulated versus dysregulated, can think about um, maybe the impact of how their brains were wired based on some experiences and some potentially very difficult experiences they may have had during early childhood. So it literally uh, affects the, the very wiring of our brain um, potentially long before that child even gets to school. And then continuing to look at uh, what happens to our brains when we've experienced trauma, we're gonna look at something called the hand model of the brain. That's from Dr. Dan Siegel. And we're gonna watch a short video first where he explains um, how this hand model works. rewarding experiences for me has been to study brain science and apply it to the experience of parenting. Were you hearing that okay? Okay, sorry, I, I thought I was on mute. I'm gonna just back it up and we'll start that just to, so you get the full, full view. Rewarding experiences for me has been to study brain science and apply it to the experience of parenting. And the hand model of the brain that I use to teach parents is very useful to understand that. So if you take your thumb and put it in the middle of your palm, put your fingers over the top, this is a very useful model of the brain. And when we can actually see in front of us what's going on in the brain, then we can change what the brain does. So let me walk you through very basically what happens in this brain and the structures in it. And it goes like this. The spinal cord comes up, represented the wrist, and then you have coming up into the skull, the brain stem and the limbic area, which work together to help regulate arousal and your emotions and the way you have a fight, flight, freeze response. These are below the cortex, the limbic and brain stem areas, and the cortex is this higher part of the brain that allows us to perceive the outside world, to think and reason. And this frontmost part of the brain, right behind your forehead, so a person's oriented like this, is actually the part that regulates the subcortical limbic and brainstem areas. This regulation is very important because sometimes you can have all sorts of things happen in our life. We're tired, we're exhausted, someone pushes a particular emotional button, and we can flip our lid. So rather than being tuned in and connected and balanced and flexible, we can lose all that flexibility, even lose moral reasoning, and act in ways that are terrifying to others, including our children. 
Now, you can actually bring yourself back online or come back to the high road and make a repair with your child, and that's important to explain to them. And you can also use this hand model of the brain to explain to children, even as young as five and six, how to understand when their emotions are rising up from the brain stem and limbic areas here, and how it's overriding the prefrontal area and making it so they may be about to split their leg. So I've had kids come tell me that they're about to go split their leg when they need a break. They need a timeout. So by even just naming this, they can explain it. And that's the power of using the hand model for ourselves and our children to help us all make sense of what goes on in the emotional communication that we have in the course of day-to-day -day life. So um, I hope you could hear that. It was a little bit soft on my end, but hopefully you were able to um, hear that, or you can just um, also Google it, just hand brain model and Dan Siegel. And next to that, we have um, the visualization of some of the parts of the brain that he was talking about. Um, so the survival brain, which represents our, our thumb, our emotional brain with the upper parts of our, our um, hand here, and then the this, this smart brain. And as he said, you know, this what's great about this is you can use it for yourself, but you can also talk to your kids about flipping your lid. And that's something that they can understand. We have a great drawing here um, on the next slide that a student did showing them um, having flipped their lid. And so there's many things that we can attribute to having flipped our, our lid, whether it's um, yelling, stomping, swearing, arguing, slamming doors, having a tantrum, shutting down. Uh, for some people, even their physiological responses of, of eating or sleeping can all happen when we, we flip our lid. So when we get into the um, last section, when we talk about self-regulation strategies, that's really going to help um, help us to prevent flipping our lids or once we have flipped our lids, how we can kind of come back down from that. So with that, we also wanted to look at stress. We hear a lot about trauma. We also hear a lot about stress, and it can be really helpful to understand the different types of stress. Of course, we all experience some amount of stress. And that's a good thing. That's a positive thing. Our bodies were designed to experience stress and to respond to stress. So you can see that represented here as positive stress. Of course, we um, respond. Our heart rate goes up a little bit. Our hormone levels go up a little bit so that we can respond in the moment. When stress starts to become a little bit more tolerable, it might be um, a higher uh, frequency of, of stress. The duration might be a little bit longer. But what makes it tolerable, the key thing here is where it's indicated it's buffered by supportive relationships. So that last part there, the toxic stress, that is the key difference there is whether or not you have a supportive relationship. So what makes stress become toxic versus tolerable, it might be the same stressor. It might, again, be the same amount of stress or intensity of stress, but it's with when we are without protective relationships or supportive people around us that's when stress can start to become toxic. And when stress does get to that level of being toxic, it can also start to have very profound effects on us, um, just like trauma. So um, we'll talk about that again um, throughout is that importance of relationships because that is really the, the key difference in mitigating the impact of these things. So with that, just brief um, overview of touching on a few aspects of what is trauma. We wanted to move into the impact of trauma. So I'm going to hand that over um, to our co-presenters to get into some of that material. Thanks, Jenna. Um, as Jenna just described, the three sort of categories of stress, um, one really helpful vid visual um, that families and uh, school staff uh, have, have found some, some, um, some uh, uh, affinity with is this idea of a stress of uh, a uh, stress tolerance window. Um, and so in this this graphic, and this is from the South Dakota statewide family engagement center, but it is used by a number of of educators and presenters um, and family and family experts to help us understand and our children understand uh, what our personal level of tolerance in those those three types of, of stress. So as we think about particularly the, the tolerable and the toxic stress that Jenna just talked about, um, here is, again, just a way of thinking about that. Um, so we all have a window, 
Uh, and and uh, in this window of stress tolerance, that blue is re representing um, what we can tolerate, what uh, we individually, that what the child can manage um, reasonably. Uh, and they can control their impulses, they can uh, manage and moderate their emotions, they're able to sort of handle the little bumps that come along the road that might be unexpected. Um, and at that point, using our hand model, they're functioning from that, that, that prefrontal cortex, they're using their upper brain, their lid is not flipped. Um, and so that blue part in the middle of the, the window of stress tolerance is really what we, we hope um, <laughs> that we as adults and, and our children are able to sort of cope with and exist in that window of, of stress tolerance. But we know that, that there are things, often we call them triggers, that will sort of boost us up over that window, outside of our window of stress tolerance. And then we call that generally a dysregulated um, affect or dysregulated mood um, or response. And that's where we to sort of talk about things outside or above the window of stress tolerance. And, and we've seen this with our own kids. We've seen this sometimes with our colleagues. We've seen it perhaps in ourselves where that stress or that trigger have has created an alarm state in us or the child. Um, the child then has flipped their lid. They're functioning from that, that limbic system, that downstairs brain. And guess what? When they're in that mode, their prefrontal cortex is not clicking in and they're not allowing the kind of learning and problem solving and connection that we know um, that we know that kids um, do best in and, and are able to develop relationships and, and learn and, and connect um, in. So, so when a child is outside of that um, window of tolerance, when they're dysregulated, this is where we get really concerned and we begin to think about different strategies um, that we'll share with you sh shortly. Beth? Yeah, so um, thinking back to the information that Jenna shared um, on brain development and trauma, we know that exposure to trauma causes fundamental changes in the way um, a child's brain develops. And those, those changes in brain development can impact um, an individual throughout his or her lifespan. Um, but when, and, and it also impacts how someone perceives the world. So um, when you look at a child who has been raised or is in the in an like, optimal development environment versus um, in a child who may have been raised in a less than optimal um, uh, environment, they may have developmental trauma. So a child who's raised in an optimal um, environment, um, that, per that child will have nurturing and stable attachments with adults, uh, a belief in a predictable and benevolent world, and that generally good things will happen to that child, feelings of positive self-worth, um, and that others can see um, their strengths, optimism about the future, and feelings that um, he or she can have a positive impact on the world. And children with developmental trauma uh, see the world Definitely, differently and not as optimistically. So um, they have a basic mistrust of adults and an inability to depend on others um, because of the experiences that they've had where they have not been able to depend on others. Um, they have a belief that the world is not a safe place and that bad things happen and they, they're usually um, his or her fault. Um, there's an assumption that others um, may not like that child or a fear and pessimism about the future and feelings of hopelessness and lack of control. And, and these beliefs will obviously just carry over everywhere, even into the school setting. So when you think about um, optimal development versus developmental trauma, you can really see how childhood trauma impacts all the means of any person's life. Um, it impacts cognition, physical health, emotions, relationships, mental health, behavior, and brain development as, as Jenna went through. So it really does impact all aspects of life. Um, so students who, or children or youth or adults who haven't been exposed to, to toxic stress and trauma likely have less extreme reactions to common stressors. Um, and in thinking about that in the school setting, um, a student with 
um, developmental trauma may respond to stressors um, by immediately going into a, a survival mode response. So three common reactions um, to stress are um, fight, flight, or freeze. Um, and these reactions are, are very hardwired into us and they're functional because they keep, keep us safe. And although they may seem excessive um, or an excessive reaction to the stressor, it actually is a very, um, uh, it, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's adaptive because it's keeping the child or the adult safe. And we're gonna watch a video about some of this stuff later too. So um, a child or a youth with a history of trauma that's just experienced a stressful event. So going back to that school example, um, that child may be um, called on to answer a question or um, may not be feeling safe due to a perceived threat from another student, um, that child may get aroused or get dysregulated very quickly. So that dysregulation happens because the sympathetic nervous system is triggered and children experience that fight, flight, or freeze response. So in this slide, they are above or below that dotted line. Um, and within, if once you're re within that dotted line, you're in what we call that resilient zone. So physiologically, this means that there's an increase in heart rate and blood pressure. And if you think back to times where you're really scared, um, you feel like your heart is racing and you're sweating and you can almost feel your blood rushing through your body, you're not using that thinking part of your brain, that prefrontal cortex. You're in um, that, that downstairs part of your brain, like that limbic system and the brainstem. Um, so when you're using that downstairs part of your brain, it is not possible to learn. Um, so students who have a developmental trauma spend a lot more time either in a hyperarousal or a hypoarousal state, and they don't spend as much time in that resilient zone. And that's really important to understand because the only way children can learn is when they're in that resilient zone. So within that resilient zone, um, we have different emotions. You can be excited or scared or, or happy or, or, or you can feel relaxed you can have a wide range of emotions within that resilient zone. Um, the key is that within that zone, the child is regulated and they're able to access that prefrontal cortex or their thinking brain at all times. And this means that they're regulated, they can uh, interact cooperatively with others and they're ready to learn. The way to live in that resilient zone um, at school or at home or, or anywhere is to teach children with trauma histories how to make that zone larger and how to return to that zone after becoming dysregulated. Um, and parents and teachers can help uh, kids do this. Um, so by making the zone larger, you can make the zone larger by, um, if you foster a community of safety, build trusting relationships, reduce sensory stimulation, create predictability with routines and expectations, um, connect and create consistency across all settings. And then if a child is dysregulated, um, an adult, a caring adult, either a teacher or a, a, a caregiver can help them um, return to that resilient zone by uh, remaining calm and avoid escalation so staying neutral when the child is not neutral, leaning into the relationships that you've built with the child, um, proactively identifying um, safe spaces where the child can go to calm down, uh, listening and validating the child's feelings. So even if the, um, if the reaction seems like an overreaction to, to us, it's not to the child. So really validating how they feel and identifying a menu of calming techniques, which Kelly is gonna go over later in the presentation. And one way to help children with trauma is to teach them how the brain works. And we watched um, that video by Dan Siegel 
which is one way to help children um, understand how the brain works. Um, it's empowering to understand what's happening inside the brain and learn that extreme reactions can be controlled. We're going to watch a kid-friendly video by Allison Sampson Jackson that can be shown to younger kids to help them understand how their brain um, is reacting to trauma. So there's no, um, there's no ball, um, noise. Problem for most people who are intervening, if you're talking to a family, most parents are going to naturally start with redirection and consequences for negative behavior. That's the first place they go. They're shaking fingers and telling somebody, stop that. You need to. I'm sorry. I'm going to just back this up because I think I skipped a, a little too far ahead. So I apologize for that. I, I, I think you go like two minutes and something, yeah, 30 seconds or something like that, I think. Or, yeah. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. When I say young, probably three to eight years old. Sometimes teenagers like it too. And so what we call this is the downstairs brain, that threat center again, is what I call the barking dog. You think about when any noise or threat makes, usually a dog will bark. So this is the barking dog, okay? A problem solver is often called the wise owl. So upstairs is the wise owl, downstairs is the barking dog, okay? When the dog barks, the owl flies away. And so when the dog's barking, the only things they can do are maybe practice blowing bubbles, maybe practice breathing deeply, things that help the dog start calming down. And that's where you build their self-care strategies. They practice lots of different things to help the dog stop barking. The first skill being recognizing when their dog barks. Once they learn how to calm the barking dog, then the owl flies back and then they can come up with solutions. And again, they're trying to get this muscle stronger. The problem for most people who are intervening, if you're talking to a family, most parents are gonna naturally start with redirection and consequences for negative behavior. That's the first place they go. They're shaking fingers and telling somebody, stop that, you need to do this. That's an upstairs brain intervention. While most children who've experienced trauma are downstairs. So the term Siegel uses is you connect, then you redirect. The only thing that will calm a barking dog or the downstairs brain is helping that child calm down. And only then, once you teach the child to calm down, can you engage the part of the brain that solves problems and actually come up with solutions for better behavior choices. And that's why it's important to respond to the need respond to the safety needs that get kicked up by threat and not just react to the behavior that happens. So Kelly is going to do the next part uh, of yep. your Thanks. Um, so yes, we, we know that this is a, a special education conference in the schools, and we definitely wanted to bring all of this really valuable information about trauma basics, about understanding um, the impact of trauma to a school lens. So what I'm going to start with was, is a little bit of information about trauma sensitive or trauma informed organizations. And we really hope um, and work really hard to make sure that our schools are becoming, are growing as trauma informed organizations. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about this and then we're going to pop back into some more of these strategies um, that that can be used at school, can be used at home, can be used in community settings uh, that really get us again into that window of regulation, um, help our kids stay in that window or expand the window so that it's a little bit easier for them to function on a day-to-day -day basis. 
basis if they have trauma impact. So very, very briefly, and this again, just from SAMHSA, Jenna mentioned SAMHSA earlier, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration talks about the three E's of trauma, but they also talk about these six principles of trauma-informed organizations. Um, so I would wanna give a little bit of time to this. Um, and these can be applied to any organization, any, 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 uh, institution. Um, and obviously, sort of from left to right, um, things that we really would expect um, in any organization if it is going to be trauma responsive and, and non triggering in the way that they do their, their business. In a school, um, I, I think we can make some of these parallels. Um, so, uh, in safety, obviously, throughout the school, throughout the organization, staff and the people they serve, so in the case of a school, the students that they serve and the families that they serve uh, must feel psychologically and physically safe. So we really want to obviously emphasize the physical safety, but we also want to keep in mind that that psychological um, sense of safety, sense of emotional um, social emotional safety is also there. Trustworthiness and, and transparency, the organization and decisions, uh, the, the way that the organization operates and the decisions are made are, are, are provided with transparency. So all clients, all students, all families, all staff in that school understand um, on, and, and are made um, aware of what's, what's happening with policies and practices. Um, so in schools, this might really look like building really strong relationships between students and their teachers, uh, trusting relationships so that child knows that what a teacher says or another staff person says can be can be relied on. Um, similarly, when a family is working with the school, that 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 level of trust is there as well. Peer support is another. Uh, piece of uh, the, the six principles. Um, and that's really where peer support and mutual self-help are really key to um, uh, establishing safety and helping promote um, healing, uh, building trust. Um, and so in a school that could be actual peer support groups for, for, for students. It can also be for staff having a collegial relationship that really embraces this idea of felt safety uh, and physical safety and creating an environment where staff do have opportunities to um, share concerns and problem solve together. Uh, the fourth principle is collaboration and mutuality. Um, and that's where power differences between staff and clients or in this in the case of schools where the school staff and the students that there is not that distinct power differential um, and that all partners in the in the school um, and the organization um, feel comfortable collaborating and feel that they have opportunity to um, to uh, to share in helpful uh, approaches. So in a school, it's not just the school psychologist that has all the answers or the, or the school social worker, but it's others in the school. It's the whole school community coming around this idea of becoming trauma sensitive and trauma informed. Um, principle five is empowerment and voice and choice. And that's where individual strengths and experiences are recognized and built upon. Um, there is an opportunity for children, for families, for staff to have a voice um, and to make choices that are validated. Um, and to develop new skills. And I think that's really, really key as we think about infusing trauma-informed practices uh, into our school. And then finally, and this is an overlying, uh, overarching umbrella that we need to be aware of, and I think has been made very clear in the last year or so, cultural, historical, and gender issues. Um, we have to move past stereotypes um, and biases, and we really have to think about how we're being equitable in our ability to, to deliver uh, services. So that was a very quick overview of those six principles, but these again can be applied in any, any setting. Uh, but we particularly hope that they are moving forward in our schools. Um, so just a, a little bit again, returning to what we would see in a trauma-informed school, what we might see in a trauma-informed home or community setting. Um, and it was a point made by, Sam, by Allison Sampson um, in that video clip was that we have to get behind the behavior. We have to understand what the need is for that child. Sometimes we call that functional analysis. So those of you who've been around special education um, for a while, you, you know that term of functional behavior analysis or functional behavior assessment. Um, this is a very, very consistent concept. We have to get behind um, understanding what we're seeing and what might be really distressing for us to see um, uh, and get get behind what what is the core function of that 
of that uh, behavior choice. Um, trauma also manifests itself through um, behaviors. Um, and when um, children either cannot or don't feel safe enough to express their fears and anxieties, we're going to often see behaviors that don't look particularly pleasant. Um, and so it's really important that we get get behind those behaviors and understand what what is um, what what's what's bubbling up there. Uh, we want to respond to the need and not the behavior. Um, and I think we've we've heard that phrase of connect before you can redirect or before you can correct, and that that's really really um, essential. Um, so what can we do? Schools, homes, um, community settings. Well, um, we're, we've simplified an approach down to some three sort of broad areas. First, we build relationship and reinforce routines. And that's the first thing that we have to do. And everything really hinges on that. So we'll talk about that in a moment. Then we want to support regulation. And then finally, we want to foster competency, which is a much higher level, um, a bigger ask for some of our, for some of our students. Um, relationship is crucial. I think you've heard that already today. Um, but we know from research study after research study that a, that a major protective factor uh, for children who are in, in um, at risk or in, in distress is the presence of a stable adult figure, a close positive bond with at least one adult in a caring role. Um, and that relationship is truly the foundation of resiliency. So talking about the resilience, going back to the resilience zone that Beth mentioned, that is core, That's, that relationship must be in place um, before we can, can get serious about building resiliency. How do we build those strong relationships? A couple of different ways. Um, we want to always be careful in the in the, in the heat of the moment to think about um, where we physically are in re in relationship to the child. So we have to really be be conscious of our physical presence. Sometimes, as teachers, as parents, when our emotions are beginning to rise, our lid is beginning to flip, the kid's lid is already flipped, we have a tendency to get louder and closer. Um, and that often is not the winning combination for our kids who are already dysregulated. So we really want to keep in mind that physical touch and, um, and our, our voice modulation. Predictability and routines are so key. If you're a parent, you know this. If you're a teacher, you know this. Um, and it's really important to remember that that, that helps build that relationship. If a, if a child cannot trust or rely on um, the response from the, the, the parent, the caregiver, the teacher in their life, they're going to have a really hard time building a deep relationship with them, especially if they're a child who's had uh, other disappointments and other challenges in their life. Um, dedicate one block of time a day to a ch fully child-directed activity. That's sometimes hard to do, but it's really interesting um, and very in um, insightful for a parent or even a teacher to just give five minutes to a child and just let them lead the, sh lead the way and, and run the show and see what's really um, key value of key value to them. And again, with the idea of predictability and routine, transitions. Transitions, transitions are often where we begin to see the lid beginning to, 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 ro to, to uh, vibrate and begin to get ready to flip because that transition is something unpredictable. And so we, we and, and, uh, and for some kids that, that unknown is really challenging. So to the extent that you can um, preload, uh, those tra those transitions, all the better. So the that is a really uh, across domains that is a really important skill. Um, so the next stage beyond that route that uh, establishing relationship and routines is self regulation. We talked about that term dysregulated and regulated earlier. Um, this is where we really want to help that kid move from that flip lid and return to their, their, their upper brain. Um, and again, calming first through connecting, um, then correcting or um, redirecting. Uh, offer choices wherever possible. Power struggles are a no win. We know that as parents, we know that as teachers. Um, so really think about where you are, um, um, wh what other options you have besides making this a, 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 a um, a power struggle that nobody's necessarily going to win. Um, teach and then practice calming strategies, especially when the child is in a regulated state. So practice this like you practice any other skill when the kid is, is 
ready and receptive to learning. So they have them in their back pocket when they need them. Um, Pre-establish then offer choices for appropriate ways to remove themselves from a situation or to manage unacceptable behavior. Um, so again, practicing that when the child is calm, where are those safe spaces? What do I need to say in a school setting? What do I need to say in my home setting to, to acknowledge that I need to go there? Um, often without a huge back and forth conversation because that can be elevating them in and of itself. And then identifying that safe place to calm down. Um, uh, I think Jenna and Beth were also helpful uh, uh, in creating some of these self-regulation activities on our list. These are great, really quick um, techniques that, that may be helpful to you, to your child, to, to uh, your class, to you as a staff member. And happily, they are all pretty pandemic friendly. They can be done within, um, within your setting. You don't have to you know, have a whole... Um, uh, track available to you outside. You don't have to be able to go out in your community, but you can do these things very, very quickly um, and gives that, that opportunity for a calming um, pause and get back online, bring that, bring that prefrontal cortex back in, into place. So I, I'll give folks just a second to look at those. And again, if you can teach those in advance, even better. And then once the child is back into regulation, that's the time you could begin developing those skills. That's when that prefrontal cortex is clicked in and you can begin to really think about uh, building that muscle, I think is what um, Allison called it, um, so that, uh, that they are ready for the next time that that potentially triggering event or uh, response um, comes into their life. So consider the need behind the behavior. We talked about that. Really listen carefully without interrupting. Um, that's a part of validating. It's really, really hard <laughs> sometimes. Validating doesn't mean you're agreeing or, or uh, affirming, but it is. it does mean that you're validating that what they're feeling for them is, is real for them. Um, uh, and then, you know, explore with your child the strategies that are going to be really helpful for the next time this um, this trigger happens. And then finally, like I said, the very highest level of skill is, is beginning to, to move beyond that self-regulation into to growth and healing, long-term healing and recovery. Um, and helping kids tell their story um, is, is one of those techniques that can really boost competency um, so that they are, become the advocates um, of, their, of their future um, and are able to um, steer steer their ship and be be open about their needs and their challenges um, as they go on. Um, so I think what we're going to do is um, take just a few minutes and watch a video that talk that Foreign Families Forward produced um, that talks a little bit about trauma informed schools. So it gives you a little bit more flavor for what that might look like. Here we go. Whoops. <laughs> One more time. I'm thinking that uh, screen share is my trigger. Here we go. Educators have a unique and valuable opportunity to create trauma-sensitive environments that benefit all students. With an understanding of the nature of trauma and how to respond to it, schools are shaping educational environments that feel secure and welcoming for all. I think one of the most exciting things for me was the day that we had our high school seniors and we started to talk about the trauma piece and the science behind it. And I, I could see them identifying students in their minds, thinking about how, how they could go back and do things a little differently, 
when we offer discussions on trauma impact and on strategies in the classroom, do we have teachers flock to those? Do teachers recognize that that's just a common responsibility? Creating a trauma-sensitive school environment that offers all students greater opportunities for academic, social, emotional, and behavior success is consistent with the vision of multi-tiered systems of support. In Virginia, Virginia tiered systems of support is a decision-making framework that guides supports needed for a school to be an effective learning environment for all students. Awareness of and responsiveness to trauma is considered a tier one or universal and preventive support benefiting all students. My role as coordinator um, with Virginia Tiered Systems of Support um, is that we've been implementing that framework within our division, not just for the academic child, but for the whole child. What does that look like socially, um, emotionally? Because as we know, um, in education, it's not just about one part. If a child cannot socially or emotionally be present and attend, then um, student success, academic success, is going to be Hard. Using these five values in classroom interactions benefits all students. The foundation for success is to have students feel safe, both physically and emotionally. If I don't feel fundamentally safe, um, then it's really hard to trust people and form a healthy relationship with the adults who are in my life, including my teacher, including you know other community members who I might be interacting with. Trustworthiness is essential. Knowing that someone will be there and be consistent for me um, knowing that someone will have my back and be that supportive person. Unfortunately, a lot of our kids come to school and they don't have that in their home environment. I think it all boils down to how the teacher reacts and gets on their level. And I think if the teacher shows an interest in that child and really goes that extra mile, that is what makes these children want to be there and want to learn and, and to keep them going forward. They need to know that they're around people they can trust and that genuinely care about them. You know, it's hard to expect punishment from somebody who doesn't care because you're thinking, well, they don't care anyway. But you can learn more from someone who genuinely cares. And if they have to reprimand you, you can, well, I understand. I probably shouldn't have done it. I'm not going to expect that from you because I know you really do care about them. When a child's upset, don't try to engage. Take a break. Give them a break. Um, that doesn't mean you're rewarding the behavior. That actually means that you're getting them to a safe place. We oftentimes see children fighting for control, maybe because they haven't had control over whatever traumatic experience they've experienced. So as much control as we can give them, the better it will be behaviorally as well as us for adults. So while the adult wants to maintain in control, by giving them choices, it often lets that child feel like they are empowered or that they have some control over their, what's going to happen throughout their day. For my children to have a choice is the key to their felt safety knowing that they have that voice and that voice is expressed when they make a choice makes them feel empowered and it builds and it builds and it builds so that maybe there is a time during a fire drill for your safety you need to exit this building okay i'm going to listen to you because i trust you when a school can create that sense of safety those relationships um and that child feels that then they can move to a place where they can then be open to be able to learn. Another way schools empower students to resolve problems is through restorative practices. Restorative practices are both a mindset and a proactive process that builds healthy relationships and a sense of community between students and educators. A student's harmful behaviors are acknowledged within the school community. Students and educators work out ways to repair harm and students learn coping strategies that change their behavior. The child might get to a place where they're gonna take ownership of that behavior and um, you know, make repair with uh, whoever they might have uh, harmed. Instead of spending the whole day in in-school suspension or out-of-school suspension, because there's no new learning that's happening there as far as I'm still building, we go to focus and recovery. And so I have a chance to reflect, calm myself down, answer some of the restorative questions about what was going on and I get a chance to have a restorative chat with a teacher. Restorative practices is really making sure that there is a safe place for students to go that isn't just about punishment. That when a discipline infraction occurs that there is a way for them to talk through the situation 
to understand what they could do differently next time. Give them the skills to be able to do that and then to restore the relationships that maybe were fractured, whether it's with a teacher, another peer, a principal, and that people do forgive, people make mistakes, and we can start over and we can learn. And then there's that just circle of trust that they now know they can trust that somebody's going to support them even on their worst day. What they're doing as to how they're doing it, right? So some sh subtle shifts can make a big difference. In the so it's critically important that families and schools are working together, particularly for children who have a trauma history. Um, first is just even sharing information together. So um, sometimes the child's behavior might look different in school than it does at home, trying to figure out what works for a child. Um, interventions that are going to be effective, having that flow of communication. It, the key thing really is communication, looking at the student individually, what are their strengths, what are their areas of improvement, um, and building upon those strengths. And to me, that really helps. We have found the most successes with schools have occurred when schools work with us, when they listen to us as we talk about our child's specific needs it will not work if you don't talk you have to have a real good line of communication with the teachers um, administrative staff um, nurses but being able to have that open um, kind of open door thing where you can call and check in and they can call you and let you know what's going on so it's really is a, a two-way street parents want to know that they have been heard and listened to so so there's a parent responsibility side to this too. It really does take a team to help a student succeed both at home and at school. And if we can create that community for that child and that family, give that family support through the school, that can make a world of difference for resiliency for that child and that family. I think with the communication um, and the interactions that we have with the school has made a world of difference with my child and me as well. You know, even though she struggles like she does, you ask her what she loves to do. She loves to go to school. And what does she want to be when she grows up? A teacher. It's, it's huge to watch a student start to see themselves differently. That is really what it's all about. The end goal is to create resiliency and to create resilient communities and resilient schools and resilient classrooms because that really embraces the needs of everyone. And within that, woven within that, is these basic and fundamental concepts of being trauma informed. Jenna, do you want to wrap us up or would you like, I can talk for a bit and then you can um, speak a moment. Um, so uh, we hope that was helpful. Uh, that is as one of a set of three videos that Form Families Forward produced on, on topics of trauma. That one was specific to trauma-informed schools, but there's also a video on understanding and addressing trauma. Um, please stay in touch with Form Families Forward. Uh, we have lots of social media options and a great website. And likewise, um, I mentioned I'm working on putting together a group called Promise to Address Childhood Trauma. Our main focus is on advocacy. So here's some ways that you can also um, engage and learn more. And so with that, I wanna thank all of you for coming today. Um, it's a challenge to get all of this information across in 45 minutes. So it's just really um, an introduction. If you want more of these kinds of topics, I uh, encourage you to let the Parent Resource Center know, let this conference know, um, because that's how these kinds of presentations come about. There are also two other related presentations at this conference that we'd encourage you to check out. One is on building resilient communities and the other is on using a trauma-informed lens to the IEP. Um, so again, we hope you check those out and contact us. And thank you so much for attending today.